number 521. After one song, I think Daniel got a song he's going to read. So, 521. I love the shades of my Lord looks to me that is
I assume by now that everyone has one of these outlines. There's some on the table back there, and there's some up here. If anybody doesn't have one, why? Well, let's see if it's good. <coughs> and the first uh, page explains where I'm coming from on this. Uh, possibly uh, all of you, most of you, not all of you, have read uh, the paragraph down at the bottom of the title page that uh, Brother Jim Bond was working for the Gospel newspaper and he asked if I would write some articles and said I could write on about anything I wanted to. Uh, and so I wrote on several subjects, but this one on the Kimney Corner Scripture is, uh, I think, created the most interest at least 11 years ago. And hopefully it uh, will uh, create some interest tonight. So this is going to be, a, I told uh, someone a while ago, I said this is a wide open class uh, nothing is especially uh, as far as questions are concerned. Each of these articles is written uh, just as it appeared. I didn't change anything. Uh, except I maybe should have changed some things that on the first page, the second paragraph down, it says, I have a good friend, Ivan Shrum. That's debatable. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know if any changes need to be made even with that. But as I said, what, what this does, uh, these paragraphs, is maybe enlighten you as to what's called chimney corner scripture, that we have, might have a more in-depth study of what the real scriptures are. But sometimes the gist of this is that sometimes we hear things and say, well, I know it's in the Bible, but then when you start looking for it, it's not there. And those have become labeled as the chimney corner scriptures. So uh, as I said in the, the article for the newspaper today, we began a series of articles entitled, entitled Chimney Corner Scripture. I've been asked to write something along the lines of the thought for the day for the Express. To make this a little more challenging and somewhat unique, I decided to focus on words and phrases that at first appear to be from the Bible. On further examination, some of these phrases may be found in Scripture, but not as they are often quoted. Some may be based on biblical principles. We'll have fun with this as well as perhaps provoking some spiritual thoughts for you to consider throughout the week. Uh, again, uh, this came from Ivan Shrum, who loves these chimney corner scriptures, and we often talk about them. In the past 11 years, we haven't let that phrase loose. Uh, we still talk about them. There was a while, one of us went to the other one say something about chimney corner scripture. Uh, so I thought I might share with some of you, the, uh, some of these with you, the etymology, that is the history of words and our findings about such phrases. Uh, we go all the way back to some of Philip Sidney's uh, prose from 50, 1554 to 1586 in his Apology for Poetry, uh, circa 1581. He wrote, notice the spelling of the day, and I quote, Our poet, the monarch, beginneth not with obscure definitions, but he cometh to you with words set to delightful proportion, either accompanied with or prepared for the well-enchanting skill of uh, music, and with a tale forsooth he cometh unto you, with tale which holdeth children from play and old men from the chimney corner. And, unquote. and so that's where the theme of this comes from, is from that, that statement. 
Uh, and as I said, I just kind of took the ball and ran with it throughout these 20 articles. Uh, in, in Sydney's day, old men sat in the corner of the chimney, by the, chimney, uh, by the corner of the chimney, uh, and discussed any number of topics. One topic of discussion was the Bible, and hence chimney corner scripture. Those elderly guys didn't always quote the exact words from the Bible. Uh, often neither do we. Today we might sit in the yard under the shade tree or gather at the gospel or diner or some other establishment and discuss any number of topics. We don't always uh, get the facts straight, but we generally get the gist of the conversation. So having said that, we take, we look in this issue at one brief example and explanation of Chimney Corner Scripture. I didn't know him from Adam. That's the, the phrase we're looking at. This statement has come from a long-discussed problem of whether or not Adam had a name. Uh, if he did not, this would distinguish him from all other individuals. A number of European great paintings depict a no-naval Adam. Frankly, the Bible doesn't say. We know he was created, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. One might assume that since an umbilical cord is for feeding purposes while in the mother's womb, and Adam being created fully grown, there would be no need for a navel. But again, the Bible does not give us the answer to this question. Watch again next time for the continuation of this series on Chimney Corner Scripture. So what we want to do tonight, and this is why you got these early, hopefully you took it upon yourself to either get a concordance or cross-reference of some sort, and you can share with us tonight uh, what you think about Adam's navel, <laughs> uh, particularly what you think about creation, and uh, it's just an age-old subject and that we can uh, talk about all night as far as that is concerned. But... Uh, that's, that's where we're coming from. Anything that anybody wants to mention here at the very outset of this before we get into uh, your scriptures and perhaps some ideas that you, you have? Anything I've read here that you want to ask about? And I'm, yes, Cora. Well, I was thinking about this when I read this, and I thought, number one, who would sit and worry or question whether or not he had a navel or not? But God made him in his own image, and he made people. You know, all of us are from God. And to me, I just, I didn't really think twice on it. I just thought, he's going he's gonna to have a navel. He's going to look like everybody else. That's my own opinion. Sure. Right. And that, that's, what, that's what the class is going to be about now. Because, as I said, it, a lot of these the Bible doesn't say. We think that it comes from the Bible. But we have opinions that we can form, and then we want to get in, as I said, the main theme of this tonight is creation itself, and that's where we're going with this. But the navel, uh, Adam's navel is kind of a starting point to get to. I, that was just, it kind of led me in a, a little different direction. Uh, you know, me and made his own, his own image. Uh, of course, we know in, in the scripture, you know, God is there. And uh, so to me, that was, that was kind of like. You know, you're not looking for a particular rancher. I know that was kind of by way of uh, finishing this off my mind. Uh, that I, I think he's talking about his, you know, uh, his interview was what was what the same thing. Okay. It was so the spirit. Well, that was kind of the direction I was. Yeah. What I was thinking anyway. I don't know if that's what, really what you're looking for. I'm looking for it. As I said, it's a white open glass. I have. I have no ulterior motive. I have no sermon outline. I don't have an axe to grind. <laughs> I don't have anything. It's just going to be wide open. And whatever you want to throw out for the class to consider, I'm just going to kind of direct the discussion. Hopefully. Uh, and Ivan's right to Danny. I guess for me, I sometimes I think differently than others, but. Um, why would we even need to worry about that? Does it really matter? You, and I agree that this has been a subject that has been debated back and forth at Gospel Diner for a long time. Just as an example. I mean, any place I've gone uh, over the years, somebody always comes up and says, What? Did, did Adam have any? <laughs> Just like you know, who cares? Yeah. But. <laughs> But that does lead us again to our subject of creation, and that's what we're going to spend our time about. Because we can't answer that particular question. Yeah? God has given us all things that pertain to life and God, and he didn't choose to tell us that. So. 
Yeah. I kind of feel like being. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't worry me one bit. Yes. Right? Yeah. Well, Eve was recreating it also. Yes. <laughs> so she apparently didn't have one either. I, I think they did, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, speaking biologically and anatomically, uh, with regard to Eve, as you said, she bore three children. Cain, uh, Abel, Seth, uh, that we know about, that there at the beginning. So she had to have the reproductive organs and the feeding tube, which is the umbilical cord. Uh, so, if, you know, you start with, uh, logically reasoning this out. But again, even with all our logic, it, it doesn't say. It. And, and don't, and let me say again, caution again, don't get so hung up on a chimney corner scripture mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter. It's just, as it says, springboard into, in this case, creation. Uh, I would mention a while ago, John 4, 23 and 24, talking about God as a spirit, and they worship him as worship him as spirit and truth. And Dana was uh, talking about, <laughs> my mind went blank, what were you talking about? What did you say? I followed the scripture then. Um, I can't remember what it was now that I, I followed the passage you were talking about. But anyway, back to Genesis 1, as I said here in, in the, uh, the article, at verses 26 and 27, this is what we're familiar with. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, there's a whole bunch of subjects that come up just from those two verses. One is evolution. Uh, that with regard to whether or not we had a, create, uh, had a creator, whether things are evolved, have evolved from a big bang theory, whether there was theistic evolution, that is, God was in the beginning or some kind of divine authority was in the beginning, but he died. And so from that beginning point, contributing that or attributing that to God, uh, was creation, but then after God died or got out of the way, that things in life evolved into what we have today. So you get it subject to theistic evolution. Uh, whether creation or evolution, you go back to the Scopes trial and Darwinism and all those things that we've heard about for, for years, and a lot of that comes to mind here. Uh, I'm just giving, throwing this out for you to build some discussion on. Another thing that comes from these passages is he made both male and female. Our society is so caught up in transgenders and uh, different kinds of, of uh, gender, I guess, that uh, a little of this and a little of that. And the last I heard, there uh, allegedly are what, 56 different uh, genders or something like that that you could possibly be. I mean, it gets really out here, you know. But, I've heard it discussed coming from these passages in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Uh, he made them both male and female. So we talked about uh, the problem of, of males living together or of females living together. We go to Romans, the first chapter, and learn there about how uh, the Gentiles had given themselves over to the lusts of the flesh, uh, men desiring men and women desiring men, uh, women. And But from the beginning, God intended one man, one woman, as in this text of Genesis, this was from creation and procreation. That is, after God created, then He, then we are made to procreate. Uh, in Genesis two and verse seven, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And He told him to go out and multiply, replenish the earth. Uh, you can't do that with two of the same sex. Uh, they cannot reproduce. There's no procreation there. We know that in the seed, seed kingdom, we know it in the animal kingdom, we know it in, in human beings. Uh, that is just one of the basic fundamental rules of nature. And yet our society has said, oh no, so that's, that's not right. So there's big battles going on based on these passages of scripture that we're looking at. So having said, and as well, as I said, I do all the talking here. So there's several subjects that you can pick up on and, and comment if you'd like to. Charles? Well, we, we do know one thing for sure at the end of the chapter 1 and verse 31 that God uh, saw everything that he made 
and uh, he said indeed it was very good. So no matter how he made Adam and Eve, however it was, it was good. Yes. Uh, because God was pleased with that. Therefore, it had to be good. So. And like I said in Genesis 2 7, he gave man the, the breath of life. Uh, going to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1, we have the, the sanctity of life. You know, when God formed life in the womb, uh, he gives us life. Glenn, did you have a comment? Yeah, they, what kind of turned my stomach because when they started talking about how many millions and billions of years something has been around. Yeah. I, I, I just, you can't. You just can't believe that. Right. There's a lot of missing links, as they say, that have to be, have to be filled that uh, just aren't filled or usually ignored. Um, somebody else? Uh, Kevin? I think it also brings up the idea when God created man in his image, we tend to put ourselves in that position as explaining it according to our culture, according to our way of life, the way we bring God up. Like, you know, so God was white, uh, you know, spoke English and all that. But, yeah. uh, that's not, I mean, we know it wasn't English or things were going around. But we tend to put ourselves in explaining God in our image instead of the other way around. Yes. We create God in our image instead of the other way around. That's right. I'm going to point Charlie going up and this is a little off the beat about what we're talking about, but uh, he brought up his last verse here and said, you know, God saw everything that he had made in the old days. And the King James Version is not doesn't just say good, it says very good. I mean he's really pleased with it, you know, with what he's done, the way it worked out. And to me that's a good example for us. I mean, if he's that pleased with it, that good. We need it. We need to be putting it in. I assume we are. Everybody that's here. We need to put the same gusto in the, the way we uh, face it and look at what God's made and uh, please it in. So, exactly. I try to do it. seems to me that every law, physical, natural, spiritual law that God will put in place, man is going to change and try to get around in some way. And they, they always want to come up with something different. And be something else in what, what the example of God says for us. You're exactly right. I, I oftentimes say we were all made by the poor woman of God. <laughs> because their, their slogan is what? Ford has what? Say a better say idea. idea. Ford has a better idea. That's what they've always said. And so you're right. You know, as far as mankind is concerned, we're all poor motor people. <laughs> but that's not true. I mean, the, the idea, you see the, the concept there, but uh, it's just not right. It's, it's, it's been pointed out. God created us, and what He created was good. Is it going over this another one chapter or two? Uh, that's what, you know, man starts separating from God, and, and God's not pleased with that. And that's where he, uh, and I don't remember exactly where that is, but where he said, man, they will be numbers, his parents are not always going to strive for them. And uh, I, can't remember, I can't remember what, just one or two chapters over, and it's not very far. I mean, in Genesis here. Yeah. And uh, I was trying to find it there real quick. But he lent the man, you know, and because of that, he lent the man's name. God said that he grieved in his heart that he didn't even make me. Yeah. I think that's in chapter 6. So it didn't take man very long to really disappoint him in that way. No. Like I kind of go along with what Jill was saying. They've always tried to find a way to do something that's for their own faith. Genesis 6 6, and the Lord uh, was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So man disappointed God in creation. Sin was introduced in after creation. So man has always abused what God has created. Any other thoughts? 
But also thinking that along with that, he 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 created he get he give a way out. Uh, you know, with no of course, nobody with no family decided to accept that. Right. Jim? I have two comments. One is uh, in defense of us that like to ask stupid questions, or at least unusual <laughs> questions. Uh, several of those things are just fun to talk about. And uh, like the gospel of time energy is a great place to talk about those kind of things. <laughs> so it's, it's just kind of fun. It's not really important, but it's interesting. And the other thing is, uh, I have a little bit of a hard time because uh, I don't think of deity as having physical characteristics, but it says that we're made in his image. So I don't, to me, those two things, at least in my mind, don't add up very well. Not the, the, the physical characteristics, you, you wouldn't identify with God. Right. Yeah, I think it's more along the spiritual. Or, right. Actually, I just don't understand what condition God's in, but I don't think of it as, as a physical being. As you know, if you we're creating His image, where do you make that? That's an interesting thought. Anybody have any comments on that? I thought about that before. Jesus. Anybody have any? What exactly was it? That when you think of God, we just think of the spiritual, but you don't think of the physical. In other words, we are created in His image spiritually, but are we created in His image physically? In other words, are we made the way we are with the head and arms and legs? Then we're just not really told. Well, God is a spirit. Yeah. The spirit has no form, but we have form. We have substance. My, my, I'm talking about shit. Somebody else. <laughs> Didn't uh, the, when uh, Moses was there on the mountain with God, did it not say that now? And I know he's spirit, but he was he must have been able to recognize God because he seen his hinder parts. Yes. So there was something there that that he identified with. What that was, yeah, we don't know. That's the only place I can really think where it shows he was physically identified or somewhere or another. That's a good point. Any, any thoughts about that? Where Moses saw God's hinder parts as it says. So there had to be something there that would identify the hinder parts. Again, we all understand God's spirit. The spirit usually doesn't have form or substance. But in a sense it does, or at least in that situation. Also thought of the Ecclesiastes 12, 7, you know, Time used with regard to Solomon's wisdom, and the spirit returns to God, but the body returns to where? Dust. dust of the ground from where it came. So God took from the dust of the ground and made man. Now, he had to have some kind of um, image, at least, uh, for him to form man in the way that he did. And there's all kinds of illusions throughout the, not illusions, but references uh, throughout the, the Bible concerning the importance of. The head and the arms and the feet, and you know those are used for illustrations. So there was, there was something there in the plan of God, even though we're not told specifically what that was. And when we're done with this body, it goes back to the dust where it came. You? Yeah. I start to think about it. I picture the human. How could anybody create anything that would serve? Purpose that we do is be able to walk around, feed yourself, yeah. you know, the senses that we have to uh, sense danger and this and that. No man could have ever created something that perfect. Kevin? Well, I was going thousand years later, but I thought when Christ came as a man, as a human, he was. You know, in my mind, I, I tried to picture it that way that yes. 4,000 years before, the plan was already in effect. And so when Christ became a man, he became a man in, in human form. Right. right. And, and that's a good point. Uh, over in Philippians chapter 2, we know that uh, he took on, as Kevin just said, 
he, Paul says he took on the, the form of man. <clears throat> in, uh, in this uh, verse 5 of uh, Philippians 2, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be evil with God, but made himself no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being, bound, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So there you have the various forms of the Godhead as spirit that we talked about. But you also have Jesus taking the form of man as a bondservant in particular. Which would also understand his activity. We'd understand his activity in that bond servant form, but it's still in the form of a man, of a human being. So there has to be, as we pointed out, there, there's no detailed explanation, but there had to be, a, back to Jeff's original question, had to be some concept that God had in making us the way we did, and in his sending, as Kevin said, sending us his son in the form of man. So there's the passages to consider. Yes. Where do we where do we come up with this fully grown part? We we'll come up with what? The fully grown. Fully grown. Yeah. That God created man. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how do we know? It doesn't really. I mean, it says you can pull and multiply, but you know, you can say that to a infant too, or you know what I mean? Like, I think maybe there's a lot more here that's even more that's not. Yeah. Detailed for us. I don't know. Uh, I never really thought about it much, but you're making me think about it. Yeah, well, <laughs> good because that's the purpose of this class. Like I said, it's different than what we're normally yeah. used to. But uh, that's that's why I'm doing it this and way. And so, so you know, maybe you know, and the trigger thoughts. Um, they grew and they naturally produced. And, you know, it was all the way. You know, kind of like along the lines of what Kevin was saying earlier. Kind of all, it was all man anyway, but yeah. do we know they were full grown? You know, at, you know, at creation, you know. But, okay. uh, at verse 8, he, he put the man whom he had formed in the garden, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree and tells man to tend that garden. So I doubt that maybe. Right. <laughs> you know, just from, again, a lot of... Sure, standard. there's probably a lot more. Like yeah, said, and that's a good question. About it, you know? It's a good question. That, uh, is there a passage that says that they were created full-grown? Well, the implications are that they were. Yeah. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. That's verse 15. And he always he always refers to him as the man, and not as a child or a baby or a friend to him. Uh, Seems like there still might be some kind of lapses, you know what I mean? That, and that's a possibility. Yeah. That are unspoken. You know, <coughs> a lot of things. And, and there you get, again, back to the subject of evolution. It takes, as Lynn pointed out, millions and millions of years to evolve. It kind of blows your mind. But there, the, the term for that is uniformitarianism, where uniform meaning that everything was in a uniform matter, manner uh, to evolve. The opposite of that is what you and I would believe is called catastrophism. And that er everything is done by a catastrophe or by uh, a change in the natural things. For instance, you think about uh, what we were talking this morning about the Ice Age and talking about how the, as far as the, where the glacier stopped here in southern Indiana, and why we have the hills here and they know that Indiana's flat. Uh, people attribute that to the glacier of the, the Ice Age. And so that's why we have the hills. Well, um, may or may not be true. Scientifically, they say that it is. Uh, it'd be hard to disprove it. I don't know how all of that worked. That was before my time, believe it or not. <laughs> but I think about the Grand Canyon. I think about a number of things around the world and on the earth that are there not as a matter of millions or billions of years to evolve or, or in the Grand Canyon things to erode, but rather just in a matter of minutes or hours or seconds or whatever, that God could have created them that way. Uh, the proof for that for me was in May of 1980, 
uh, when Mount St. Helens blew up. I preached on that a few months ago. And just within a few minutes, uh, Spirit Lake was transformed into a nice, smooth lake into the trees that were all around it were uprooted and set just like they were planted in the bottom of Spirit Lake. And it happened within just a few minutes. Uh, so that's called catastrophism. And it's more plausible for me, you don't have all those big gaps to fill in <laughs> to do with evolution and, and uh, uniformitarianism. Uh, and, and rather than just ignore them, it's easier uh, and more plausible, I don't just call it it's easier, but more plausible to believe that God is infinite power as the uh, uh, designer, intelligent designer, uh, had all these things that he created and he formed. Makes much more sense than uh, said the uniformitarian. And yet, uh, schools teach this and, and uh, museums teach this that uh, we are here over millions of years. And, uh, it's a slap in the face to what the Bible really teaches. Good questions, good comments. Appreciate thus far. I put some passages up here again for those who are live streaming, but for us also, just in case we got off some tangent somewhere, but just kind of keep us focused. For instance, there's a three passages here in Mark in chapter 10, 13, and 16 that have to do with creation, and these, of course, are the words of Christ or the words referring to Christ or to Him as the Son of God. Uh, at verse chapter 10 and verse 6, but from the beginning of the creation, male and female, made he them. We've discussed that a few minutes ago. We'll hear it from the Old Testament. But here we find a reiteration, a repeat of that in the New Testament. In Mark 13 and verse 19, for those days shall be tribulation such as there have not been the like from the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never shall be. So here again we find... We don't know anything about eternity either before the creation or after this earth. Uh, when I say we don't know anything, I'm talking about we don't know its beginning and we don't know the end. There is, as far as we know from the scriptures, there is no end. That's why it's called eternity. And while we have this small frame of time here while we're on this earth to prepare, we can answer every question as to where we came from or where God was when he created man. Uh, he may have come from uh, who knows? We're just not told. Uh, so we have to, to deal with what we are told, and that is that he created us in this time frame, and so we're looking forward to a time after this where there is no end, and there may be no, uh, no beginning as far as marking of the time is concerned. Uh, then in chapter 16, verse 15, and he said to them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to the whole creation. So this is referring to mankind in general. Uh, that's just one version. Uh, some versions say whole nations, or all nations, but some uh, translate this as the whole creation, including all of mankind. So we are here not because we came up from fish to frogs uh, to walking on four legs and two, so on and so forth, uh, not that uh, concept at all, but we're here because we are created by God. I think Corey, somebody mentioned this in the very beginning of this, uh, as far as you know, all of us being created, being people. Anything on those passages in Mark? Yeah. 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 People who talk about the millions of years of evolution, they're the people that have no faith. I have faith in God, so I can accept what He says for what it is. And they have to justify existence and mankind by trying to come up with some formula that said, well, this is how it happened. But when they have no faith, they can't accept what. Good point. In my mind, this isn't just basically my opinion, but it, but it comes from almost a necessary effort. You know, you want you want prejudice. You know, they're talking about billions of billions of years. Okay. Well, is it not long? 
sort of think that God had enough first to create something in an aid state where it could sustain itself. Sure. I, I mean, that's always been the simplest solution to me. No question about it. Yeah, go back in the six days of creation and everything was, you know, God created. There were plants, trees, sun, moon, stars, everything was planted. And the way that things naturally do, you know, you've got to have, you know, things have to die and decay in order to make new things. Right. And so it was obviously he created it and it had to stay like that. That's why I say by necessary inverts, I mean, that's just the way he designed it. Yep. Why should we try to limit God? That's, I mean, God is no different than the mm-hmm. president. He's, you know, when we try to explain these things away, we're, we're trying to limit God. Exactly. Well said. There's a, a few passages in Romans that I've listed here, and I, I referred to Paul Gold at the beginning of our discussion tonight. Uh, verse 20, for the invisible things of him, uh, for the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived through the things that are made, even his everlasting power and divinity, that they may be without excuse. So this is speaking, of course, in this text to the Gentiles. The Hebrews knew God because he had worked with them and through them and showed them miracles and being led out of Egyptian bondage, you had uh, men like Moses and Joshua and, and prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, and, and down through the centuries, uh, the Hebrews were, were God's chosen people. So now there's this grafting in of the Gentiles, uh, and the Gentiles could have known God Himself by simply looking at nature. How many times do we refer to that? Even in our prayers, I've heard so many of you, brethren, thank God for the change of the seasons. Whatever season it is that we're grateful to, and this there's a, a system, a logical order to all of this: the cosmology, the teleology, all of those ologies, the whole studies about the order of things. Colossians 1, 14 through seventeen says that all things are held together by Christ, and so the reason our planet doesn't go flying off into space somewhere, and while we're just exactly uh, ninety was it ninety three million miles or ninety two million miles from the sun. And we don't get any closer, don't get any, any uh, further away, because if we did, we'd freeze to death or we'd burn up. That all has to be kept in order. And so the Gentiles, Paul is saying to the Romans, he said, you could have known God if you just looked at nature. And we say the same thing today. Some of you have already expressed that here this evening, just by looking at nature itself. Then it, uh, he says, we're without excuse, and he talked about what I was mentioning while ago, the eternity everlasting power and divinity like Kevin said, why do we try to limit God? Uh, because he is uh, omnipotent and omniscient and has the everlasting power. Uh, we jump over to chapter 8, verses 19 through 22. And he says, for the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to vanity not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together together until now. Now there's a whole mouthful of words (laughs) in verses 19 through 22. Let me stop there and see if you have any thoughts about that. Glenn? Who's the sons of God? The sons of God? Anybody know the answer to that? I know we've only heard that one son. Yeah. Well, there's Old Testament passages that talk about how we are gods, too. We only think about being God, just one God, but we are gods in a sense of that text. Sons of God, there's been all kinds of speculation on this. Anybody know much about this? We are sons of God or children of God as Christians. That might be one thought that we have. There are some theologians, I guess, we call them that, that believe that they were the sons of God that came down in 
beginning in the form of the Nephilim, the giants, uh, and all that. And so there's a, you know, that possibility, I suppose, how remote that might be. Well, I have no idea. Why I, didn't, I thought I left that at home. All right. I fell up here in my pocket, it wasn't there, and I thought it was home. Uh, any answer here on the sons of God? In this, in this context of Romans 8. That has caught my attention. I yeah, know. yeah. That's a good question. It's, and I've heard a lot of different things speculated as to, to what they are. Um, in uh, verse 21, it refers to the liberty, corruption to the liberty of the glory of the children of God. And I, I'm thinking that's back in verse 19 where he says, wait for the revealing of the sons of God. Um, and I'm thinking that's the same phrasing identifying the same people. I may be wrong about that, but just as we are, we might say we are Christians or saints or disciples, um, the phrasing here would refer to those related to God through Jesus Christ. I can't, I can't tell you just off the cuff exactly what other people say about that. I, well, I'm not sure about people buying it totally, but I just said that's a lot. Like you already said that. But it, it's possible there is some separation between the creature or man and the sons of God, both the in there in verse 19, from the earnest expectation of the creature, creation. Uh -huh. And I'm assuming he's talking about man. Right. Uh, waiting for the manifestation of, or, or the revealing of the Son of God. So that does, it does seem to show some separation there. I, I don't know like to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not sure we're totally meant to. I remember when Summers was here, he, he preached a lesson on this, and I was more confused when he got done than he started, but, but that's maybe my problem. But uh, I, I remember talking about this, and that's where I was coming from with the Nephilim and the Giants and all this stuff. We used this phrase and tried to explain it, but I, I really didn't get it. Uh, so I missed the boat there, I guess. And I, I'm just hesitant to go ahead and say, well, it's this, because I don't know what it is for sure. Well, and we also know that. Uh, you know, like back in Job. You know, when 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 the, everybody the, all those all those they were coming before God to present themselves. And that was was that book of the angel, right? Yeah. Now you know they're they're mainly obviously we don't totally understand. Yeah. The same we're giving just enough information that he wants to solve. That's it. I will try to find out about that uh, more specifically for anybody that's interested. Let me, I've got about three minutes left. These last few scriptures up here. And I, I just put these up just as points uh, of interest for our discussion tonight so we don't have to get through them. Uh, but if you feel like you should say something, like, please interrupt me. Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God for the, the firstborn of all creation. Again, I'm talking about the people. Colossians 1.23 if so be that you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached in all creation under heaven, where um, I, Paul was made a minister. Uh, Hebrews 9.11, But Christ, having come a high priest of the good things to come, uh, through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. And 2 Peter 3.4, saying, where is the promise of his coming for from the day that the fathers fell asleep? All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In Revelation 3.14, And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things say as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So there's just a number of passages that you can look up for yourself under the, the word creation. And this is uh, what is given. And as I said, we have more time. We could deal more with this. Especially, I like this in the Second Peter three and verse four, because uh, people sometimes do believe that things remain the same as from the beginning of creation, and we can speculate and talk a little bit about that. But 
Uh, our time is just about up, and I really appreciate your input this evening. Next week, the Lord's willing, we'll go to the next one, and we'll be talking about rearing children. So if you have any thoughts on how to uh, raise children, as opposed to raise Cain, uh, <laughs> uh, then you can share with us at that time. Anything else anybody has? On creation. I just want to say one thing. I was trying to look it up there. Job 1 and 2. In other words, today, when the Son of God, his actual mention of the Son of God, uh -huh. came before him to present himself. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For our invitation tonight, uh, I go back uh, to about uh, 15, 16 months ago. Uh, Jane and I and the family were uh, viewing the Mayan ruins. And uh, even before that, back in 2012, uh, the Mayans had predicted the end of the world would be then. And so it was uh, in uh, 2012, before 2012, of course, they predicted that would be the end of the world. And when we were there, it was interesting to see all of their uh, statutes and or statues and uh, memorials and uh, pyramids and towers and everything uh, that they had. And so the ancient Mayan civilization believed that the end of the world would happen on December 21st, 2012. And since that time, uh, there have been a lot of others who have speculated uh, the end of time. But in fact, no one knows, nor can they know, when the end will come. Uh, but warnings from the gospel tell of the the signs to look for before the destruction of Jerusalem uh, back in AD 70 when that did take place. But we're talking about uh, concerning the, the coming de de destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Mark says in Mark 13 at verse 32, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Now, that's in the context of referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. And he was trying to warn the people. Uh, and in the same way, the principle is therefore applied that the end of time for, as we know, the judgment would come about. Uh, and uh, Matthew's account of the same incident states in Matthew 24, 32 through 42. And I'll take a moment just to read those verses. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Let me stop there for just a moment. And, and all of my friends and associates around, they belong to various religious groups. Every one of them is trying to say that this is a sign, that's a sign, that the end times and revelation and all that. And they use this passage, and this is one reason I want to talk about this tonight. To, for us to understand that, that when the, the Lord was warning about this, He was not talking about the end of time, but He's talking about that generation and the soon-to-come destruction of Jerusalem. At a time of this was written, perhaps in the 60s, uh, eventually, as I said, tw uh, 10 years later, uh, I, and I'm just using these as ballpark figures, that uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. And this is why, if you look at that phrase, 
that says this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Either those people are still standing there waiting for them to happen or they passed away. And, and it did come. So in their generation at their time, uh, this is when destruction of Jerusalem came about. But as I said, not to discount judgment as far as the final day is concerned, but that's really not what is being talked about. He does draw an analogy here and a parallel. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's never, never pass away. However long we last, the Lord's words will be here for always. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. It was as it was in the days of Noah. And here you go back and you study, as was mentioned this evening, from Genesis 6 through 9, about Noah and the story that's given there and how that Noah preached to those people. Nobody would listen. There were signs and nobody paid any attention to them. So here in this text by Matthew, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So he uses this in warning that generation about the coming of the destruction upon Jerusalem. And in the same way, saying at the end of time, at the judgment, that whoever is, is left after this generation, that there, there would be things that would happen. That two men will be left in the field, one will be taken and the other left. And again, that was referring to them that were farmers in, in uh, Israel at that time. And you'll not find, as some interpret this as being a rapture, where one of them will be caught up in the rapture and the other is going to be left here. That's not what he's being talked about. He's talking about this: the destruction of Jerusalem is going to come so swiftly, so quick, so fast, that one will get out of the field and the other won't have time. That's basically what he's talking about. And upon that principle, so shall it be in the day of judgment. Not that one would literally or physically be left here, but it will come so fast as a thief in the night. The trump will sound, and all that are in the Lord will hear his voice and be caught up together with them in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 18. But again, he says, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. How many women do you know now today grinding with a handmill? Well, that, I mean, if you're going to interpret this literally, then the, the, the handmill has to be taken literally too. You can't have it both ways. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken, and the other left, just like the guys out in the field. The destruction of Jerusalem is coming so quickly that they're not going to have, not everybody's going to have time to get away. So the point is, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So here again, using Jerusalem, he is making this applicable unto even the judgment day. And the fact remains that regarding the end of the world, no one knows, but we're told to be prepared for that which is inevitable. And that's why we always extend the Lord's invitation. If you're not right with God this evening, make sure that you are uh, before you are right with Him before you leave this building. And consider finally this uh, passage in Second Peter chapter three. Well, not finally. I have about three others here to to give real quickly. But in Second Peter three verses three through five, know this first of all: that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, "Where is the promise of His coming?" We read this a moment ago in class. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long before or long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Then Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. And 1 Peter chapter 1, or chapter 4, at verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore be of sound judgment and sober mind for the purpose of prayer. John 11, at verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. You see, all of these are preparation passages that just like the, before the destruction of Jerusalem, the people were warned, warned 
that generation would not pass until these things be fulfilled, and it would come quickly. In like manner, then those that are uh, you and I it, that would live, if we are allowed to live that long, uh, to see this judgment day, we are uh, as no, our faith is that we will be in the resurrection, as he says here in, in John 11, verse 24 to Martha, uh, that we will rise in the resurrection. On the last day, John 5, 28, 29 talks about those under the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Then we understand in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 10, for all, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is why we extend the Lord's invitation. We don't want the Lord's hellfire and brimstone damnation and condemnation for you to suffer through that. He says that, as I always point this out, there are two kinds of people mentioned here. Those that do not know God and those who will not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the encouraging words that Christian has, that we all have as Christians is that we do believe in God and we believe in His plan of salvation and we will escape the fiery death. No, no matter when it comes, the point is be ready. So if you're an individual tonight who is trying to make preparation for anything in this life, make sure that you make preparation for the life that is to come through your faith, your obedience to Christ. And if you've once taken the steps of repentance and baptism, then you need to, and have gone back into the world, you need to come back and be re restored. So as we sing this almost persuaded, we would ask that you would not be almost, but altogether persuaded to become a Christian this evening. Will you come as together we stand and sing? Almost persuaded, almost persuaded. Fritz, would you dismiss us in word of prayer in just a moment? Should we mention any sick this evening? Anyone?
for Sunday morning at 8.30 and uh, Bible study back here at 9.45 and, and uh, 10.30 for service. There's nothing else uh, about this business. Dear Father, we have to thank you for this day, for his many blessings. We especially thank you for the time we've had to get here to this evening to study thy word and to sing songs of praise unto thee. We pray that our study has been profitable to us. We pray that you would be with us as we go out from here to meet the ones of the world. We pray that we would be prepared to give an accounting to those people of what we believe and why we believe it, that they might be converted unto thee. We pray that you be with those that are sick, those that cannot be here tonight because of health reasons. We pray that you would put your hand upon them and comfort them. These are the ones that are tending to them that they might not lose heart. We pray that you be with the ones that are not here tonight because they have chosen not to be. We pray that you would touch them in some way that, that they would see that they need to be here, they need to be an encouragement to us and to themselves. Be with us as we go through our lives that we would always be doing and saying those things that would be pleasing, that would bring nothing but, but glory and honor to the name of our Savior Jesus the Christ. It's in the name of Christ that we do pray. Amen.